Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days to join us for this Burn Vacant webinar entitled One Tragedy is Enough. I'm sure you're all wondering what it's about. We'll, we'll be expanding on that a bit later. Um, just by way of introduction, for those of you that don't know, my name's Alan. I'm the General Manager for Burns Acre. And on behalf of the firm, I'd just like to give you a very warm, well, certainly in Durban, a very warm welcome um, on behalf of BA. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, um, our, our Burns Acre webinars are generally not long protracted um, webinars and presentation with loads of detail but really they, they're intended as thought provokers or thought starters um, to initiate a bigger conversation afterwards. And hopefully we'll give you, or you can take what we call at Burns Acre a few nuggets from this presentation um, and just really see how you can apply those to your situation and um, whatever that may be. So just a few housekeeping rules before we kick off. Um, everybody has been placed on mute, if you don't mind just staying on mute. Um, just to eliminate any distractions and background noises. We do have a Q&A session after the, after the presentation where you're welcome to, to raise any questions that you feel may be relevant. And please also feel free to raise any questions you have in the, in the chat box. You're welcome to raise them in, in the Zoom chat box. And um, our team will do our best to actually answer those questions. If we feel that there's a more detailed uh, detailed explanation required or we can't give you give you all the detail we'll either reach out to you on on email afterwards or feel free to email any of us um, after the presentation and we'll do our best to get back to you with with the detail so i think the big question is why one tragedy is enough although i know it sounds like a, a best-selling book and i think we might be onto something there it's, it's actually not it's, it's something that we're finding quite relevant um, both in our client base and what's happening in the market. Um, we're finding, or we see that a lot of, a lot of people, um, our clients and, and out in the market, have specialists assisting them with certain things. So they might have personal accountants, they might have company accountants, they might have financial planners that are dealing with their investments, they might have insurance brokers that are dealing with their life insurance, they might have attorneys that are assisting them with some sort of estate planning, but there's a common thread that runs through all of these different elements. Um, and that is you and your death. And what actually happens is your death brings all those together. And, and often we see people deal with these, these matters in isolation or these, these aspects um, of their, their states. They deal with them in isolation. And on death, you'll often find the language being spoken by your insurance broker is not the language being spoken by your financial planner or your accountants. And that can have massive ramifications for your loved ones that are left behind. So although it's quite a, quite a macabre and grim thing to, to speak about, it really is relevant and, and we need to plan for our death. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Bradley Woolrich. He's the Managing Director for Burns Bakert. Managing partner, also chartered accountant and registered auditor. Um, loads of experience in, in this field. And I'm going to hand you over to, to Bradley and he'll be talking us through and taking us through the, the kind of thinking um, that you should be adopting in your in your estate planning and hopefully give you a few nuggets that in, in the firm's experience and that his, his experience is picked up and hopefully share that with you today. So Bradley, I'll hand over to you. Uh, you're on mute, Brad. Thanks, thanks, Alan, and morning, everyone. Um, it's good to have you all with us. And, and I know the, the topic's quite somber, but hopefully we've, we, we're going to give you a really pragmatic view of, you know, the elements. That's really what today is about. It's about the elements of, of, of this type of thing. And just to give you something to get started. So what we're seeing a lot um, historically was that you know, there, there wasn't really tragedies, you know, we, we have, we don't come from wartime, our generation. So the worst case scenario would be that someone would, you know, get in a car, go out and never come home. And, and that happened, you know, fairly infrequently. But what we've seen in the last year or so with the pandemic is that families are torn apart immediately without warning. You know, one minute we're all having dinner, 
The next minute, someone's not feeling well and, and, and has a fever and a bad cough. They get taken to the hospital. Their family says goodbye to them at the, at the, at the door. And that's the last time that person's ever seen. And, and that's really created a stark reality for many of our clients and, and, and obviously for the market. So I wanted to take you through you know, that side of things. Uh, a little bit of humor. Have a look at the man there. He's on his way to heaven, but he's not actually dead. He's just the repair guy. So I thought that was quite funny. Um, I hope you enjoy it. So let me take you through the elements today. So the content, we're just going to have a quick conversation around, around wills and life insurance. Then we're going to get into some banking and liquidity conversations, then some estate planning and estate duty. Um, we're going to go through some key information that we think is worthwhile you having, some documents and what we call wishes. We're just going to have a quick chat about kids because I've got kids and so do most of us. And, and it's, a big, it's a big question for us and in choosing an executor. So hopefully this will give you a big picture. We've also, in, in Burns Acre fashion, created some tools for you. So you should have your notebook where you can take notes from. If you don't, please email Tammy, uh, T-A-M-M-Y, at burnsacres.ca.za. She'll send you the notebook now. And then after the presentation, we're also going to send you a little checklist. And um, you're welcome to use our digital vault as well, you know, if it's necessary. It's, it's literally just where you save your data that's so important. So if I move on to the first slide, um, in terms of wills, without a will, your affairs will be divided into state. And it's amazing to me the number of clients who either don't have wills or did a will 50 years ago. Um, I realize that it's admin and it's not fun, but it's such an important element of, of, your, of your plan. And as most of our clients are business owners and high net worth individuals, there's a lot of money at play. There's people, there's jobs. You, you, you really need to do this. So a couple of the things I wanted to raise as, as critical today was number one, your will is where you express, express wish is documented. So unless you don't have a wish, that's the place to make sure that what you want for your assets or for the value that you've created, um, that's, where, that's where it's going to happen. So we really encourage you to speak to someone and, and do this and, and get your will up to date and have it relevant. And it's, it's important things like who gets the wedding ring? There's only one wedding, wedding ring. There might be three children and you might be intending for your children to share equally, but who gets the wedding ring? And, and the, list, the list goes on. I think, I think you get the point. But the point is, without a will, it gets very messy very quickly. The will so that it's part of that agreement and that it's clear. But the little tip from us or from Burns Aikert is you'll see the light bulb. The executive's fees, I think they can go up to about 3%. I don't know the exact number, but you can pre-agree a fee with your executor and you can negotiate a fee of 1.5 or 2%. Now, the more substantial your estate is, or, or irrespective, actually, the difference in 1% or 2% on your, on your estate is essentially the difference in what your children will inherit. So we really want to, to encourage you to be clear on your executor and their fees. That's the tip for today. And to and then to have your will. Um, and just remember that your, your will will give your loved ones clarity about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So that's the story on wills. I just want to show you a little joke that we've put together, what we put together that we found for you. Um, I think some of us like the idea of coming back, especially if we've managed to have a little bit of a savings pot. Unfortunately, it's highly unlikely that we're going to get our own money uh, in our reincarnation, but the old lady certainly you know, had a, had, had a, had a, gave me a smile. So if we look at our life insurance, I think this is the one area where I was, I was not up to speed last year and, and, and the pandemic really kicked me into gear. Um, so we need to try and understand what is life insurance because we all think of it and, and we all sort of half understand it, but it really goes pretty deep. So life insurance is the lump sum that replaces the key individual in my mind. So at the moment, someone works and they bring in a salary. If something happens to that person and they don't have the ability to bring in the salary, then the only thing left to do to protect the family is to have some sort of lump sum. So that's, it. That's, that's important and that's what life insurance does. It brings that lump sum into the family from which you can purchase an annuity or, or do whatever you want to do. But I think the complexity comes into the next section, which is what, what is it used for? So number one, if you're going to have a state duty, 
having life insurance is a pretty good idea to cover that tax. Otherwise, your estate's just going to decrease. And I'll deviate for a moment, but estate duty is currently 25%. So if you think of your assets, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have accumulated 10 million rand, um, aside from the abatement, well, let's call it 13.5 million rand. You'll get three and a half million rand for free from the government. But if you've got 10 million rand net, you're going to pay two and a half million rands estate duty, which is a lot of money. So we like the idea of the possibility of having insurance, which is essentially cash to cover your estate duty. So that's something for you to think about. Also, if you've got existing bonds and debt, specifically on your home, and someone's paying that bond every month and they're no longer generating an income, it's ideal to have that bond settled so that the family can live in the house bond free and they only have to have enough income for rates and, 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 and levies and, and that sort of thing. So that's something to think about is your existing debt. And then of course, what are you gonna live off going forward? So that's where the life annuity and that's where the, the benefit of insurance comes in to help with that side of things. And, and then of course, from a business perspective, it can provide working capital um, to help a business see itself through a, a difficult transition. Um, we have a lot of those examples where something happens, you know, something terrible like the car crash or a fatal self-choice or the coronavirus. And the business carries on. The people, everyone else gets to work the next day. So just some things to note that life insurance is generally not tax deductible. So that's a problem. It makes it more expensive. And the proceeds can be premium. The premiums can be taxable. So the proceeds from the premiums. So the payout. So that's something to think about. Uh, in terms of your planning. A little light bulb for you is whatever insurance you have, a lot of people say, I've got 3 million in insurance. And that sounds like a lot, but it doesn't help if the estate duty is 3.5 million. You haven't covered anything. You haven't covered the estate duty or anything else. So it's not about how much insurance you have. That's what I had to sort of appreciate last year. It's about what the insurance will do when it's paid out. And that quantum is the plan. And that's what you need to be careful of. You need to be careful that you have enough money in your insurance package. And of course, the, the quid pro quo is that insurance is expensive. And I understand it. But this is, we're talking about serious stuff here. I mean, if you are someone who, I'll use myself as an example. Um, my wife works with me um, and my children are five and two. So without me, my wife's income would be uh, impacted because I drive the business and my children are not capable. So I need my insurance to, if I go into hospital with the coronavirus and don't come out, I need my insurance to cover my children right through to the end of their schooling. I need my wife, who's only 41 years old. She, I, I probably shouldn't say that, my wife's 21 years old. And she, um, she needs to live for the rest of her life with an income. So I had to sit down and calculate the value of our home, the value of the schooling, the value of her life annuity. And I had to bite the bullets. And you know, a lot of us like the idea of, of having spare cash, but my decision was that having that, that peace of mind, especially during the pandemic, where things feel so uncertain, that should something happen to me and should the insurance pay, because that's another paranoia that you, you, you don't get sufficient insurance in terms of the, not sufficient, in terms of the clauses, be very careful about what they're covering and how they're covering it. Um, but once they get paid, they'll be set for life. And that's the point of it, because while I'm alive, I can protect them, but when I'm not around, I can't. So something less morbid to move into, but highly practical, we see this all the time, and that's banking. So once you report your, 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 yourself as, once someone reports you as late, one of your relatives, your bank account's gonna get frozen. Now, this doesn't work in families where there's one central bank account, where the cash is held in one account, because how are you going to access money with a frozen account? So we need you to be aware of this, is, is that once that happens, what's the plan? Have you got cash? And we've given you a few tips. One thing we just would like you to note is that if you have a joint account, that's going to get frozen. So in order to, to have a plan, we very much encourage you and your spouse to have separate bank accounts. Um, you can use one bank account transactionally, that's fine, but have separate bank accounts that are accessible to you at short notice. That's, that's really the point. Have your surplus funds, have, uh, have the ability to transfer funds at very short notice, so log in. And, and to do that, um, you need to understand a few things. Like for one thing, you and your spouse should be loaded as, as beneficiaries so that you can do quick transfers, but you must understand your payment limits, how much you can pay per day and per month. So an example would be having a payment limit of 50,000 Rand a day and having 500,000 Rand in the bank, 
you don't have 10 days to transfer the money. So you need to know how to change limits. And a lot of the stuff might sound obvious, but I can talk to you from the perspective of, of a married man who this stuff's not obvious to a lot of people. So we have to show each other how to do the banking, how to log in, how to change limits, where the cash is, which accounts it's in. And once we're able to have do this, then we can move money at short notice. And, and that's important. So our last little point was, you know, in order to prevent some sort of tragedy, it is useful to leave your family with some cash. Three to six months is a lot, but sometimes an estate can take nine to 24 months to wrap up. So three to six months might not be enough, but it's certainly a lot better uh, position to leave them in than no access to cash. So there's nothing worse than seeing a family with a, a late person and the rest of the family has got 20 million in assets, but no cash. They can literally not even buy food. Their credit cards are closed. So, and the assets are generally property. And so now this family, you know, before they can access money, they have to go through absolute turmoil because they simply don't, they're not able to sell a property in five minutes. Everything's locked down and it becomes a real problem. So, and this is what we're talking about. Again, if I use my family as an example, um, my entire family is overseas. So, there's no one here to even help my wife out if the situation got difficult in the very short term. And certainly over a few days or a week, money could be transferred and someone could help. But the point of what we're talking about today is to not put yourself in these positions. So when you're dealing with the grief, and, and, I, and I was reading an article about that tragedy that happened in Cape Town last week with Anele Tembe, and the, the, the words they use, which is often used, is that the partner was inconsolable. And, and, I, and I, I, I think about the concept of being inconsolable through grief, yet with the responsibility of children, for example. And you can't get away from that. Those children are going to want to be bathed. They want to be fed. They're not going to understand things. But now you want to add further complexity around there's a lack of cash or there's a lack of planning or there's a lack of information. And that's really the point of today. It's to say, take a projected view of what the tragedy would look like and then take it from the view of the people that are left behind and look at what they're dealing with, which is grief and or children and or everything else, and then compound that with an in in inability to do basic banking or access basic cash, irrespective of your wealth. Now you start to take the tragedy and you start to make it worse. And so hopefully that helps you understand that. And this banking section is something that's relatively easy to set up. A more complicated um, concept, which we want to take you through, and we've kind of alluded to it so far, is liquidity. So liquidity is available cash. That's what it is. And that's really what I've been talking about. Um, and that's what I need you to understand. It's available cash. It's what can I access, not what do I have? Because what you have may be locked. It's what you can access that matters in the short term during the crisis. So estate duty is something I want to talk to you about because I think it's an incredibly misunderstood aspect of tax and it's critical. So when you die, the government will tax you, just like when you worked. It's unreal, actually, but it is what it is. So every month, we all go to work, and every month, the government takes a piece. And in South Africa, as we know, it's about 40%. And they say, thank you for your efforts. We'll take almost half. <laughs> when we die, they go, well done on saving with the residual balance of your after-tax money, but we're going to take 25% of your assets. Now, here's the part I want you to hear, because I'm not in a position to confirm this, but I calculate estate duty as 45%, not 25%, because I believe that at some point we are going to be globally aligned. I think in the UK it's 40%, in the US it's 40 or 45. I cannot see the ANC government indefinitely leaving estate duty at 20%. It's also how they can access rich people's money because eventually that person will die and 25% of his money will go. I use 45% for my planning. So my worst case scenario is priced into my plan. And that's what I'd be encouraging you to consider is yes, 25% is the status quo, but if you plan around them adjusting it, then you're covered. And if they don't, well then your family benefits. So that's just something to, for you to think about. Estate duty is very closely linked to donations tax. And the reason they do that is because if you knew that, let's say you got a terminal cancer diagnosis and there was a differential, you would just donate your estate and pay the reduced amount. But estate duty kind of matches that. So what they do on both taxes 
is the first 30 million is at 20%, and thereafter it's at 25%. Now, bearing in mind, I think this is going to move towards 45%. We can see how quickly these numbers have a significant impact on the value you leave behind. And it's the value you leave behind after tax that your family will live off. Your family won't live off the pre-tax amount. So if you left them 10 million rand and you assumed 10 million rand was a life annuity of 50,000 rand a month, you might be leaving them 6, 000, 6 million rand, which is a life annuity of almost half. So you need to be, instead of 50,000, it could be 30,000. So you need to be extremely cautious about what you leave your family with, especially if you have a family of um, people who haven't worked for 30 years. You, you, you can't expect your 55-year-old husband or wife or 60-year-old husband or wife who hasn't worked for three decades to go out into the market and generate significant income. You, you're asking a lot of, of the people you leave behind. And, and so this is why I'm so passionate about the topic, because I understand it and, and I feel it's highly relevant to myself. So liquidity planning is quite important, because if we plan in advance, then we can actually reduce the taxes because we can now have a strategy to say, that's how much the tax is going to be. Let's see how much less we can make it. That's what liquidity planning is. Um, so that's important. And we often do that with our IT144 and using our donations allowance to decrease our estate. That's the simplistic way of doing it. There's far more complex ways, but at a minimum, you should all be doing that. That's very easy to do. And it's one form once a year to SARS and it reduces your estate duty by 25,000 Rand a year. So if you do it for 10 years, you've reduced your estate duty by 250,000. I mean, that's the point of planning. That's really what we're here to do today is to encourage planning and thinking in this space. So having adequate insurance is gonna be part of your liquidity plan. And then of course, I mentioned earlier, cost management. So limiting costs, managing your executive's fees, which can be substantial, but those can run into the hundreds of thousands of rands. Those fees, if they're limited, are part of your liquidity plan because you've now saved half the fee, which could be 100,000 Rand or 200,000 Rand. These are big numbers. So that's liquidity. And I hope that that helps you. Um, the next thing we move into is estate planning. So now I've, I've alluded to that in the liquidity conversation, but it's essentially estate planning is determining which assets that you have will be preserved, managed and how they will be distributed, who they will go to and what the tax will be on that. So we talked about your wills, we talked about donations, but really the, the light bulb here is that when you do estate planning, and we can do this for 20 years because you can estate plan until you die. So I'm 41 years old. I can be doing estate planning for the next 30 years for myself. I'll be 71. If I look after myself, maybe I'll get to 81. That's 40 years. If medicine helps me and I get to 91, I could be doing estate planning for the next 50 years, provided my faculties uh, stay with me. And the point is, can you imagine the tax reduction I can achieve with 50 years worth of effort and planning? And this is applicable to all of you here today. You might not get the 50, you might get 10 years, 20 years or 30, but you can't think in, in, in a binary context with regards to estate planning. It's not one or zero, it's one per year. And it's one per year you're allowed. And none of us are planning to die. This isn't the seminar as to how to leave. This is the seminar that's what happens if you leave. So we're essentially all hoping to stay. That's why we eat healthy food and drink lots of water and go for our runs. But it doesn't mean we don't get to plan. So that's something for you to think about. And I do think that having a complex uh, document is worthwhile. Really understand the detail behind what's going to happen, where the money's going to come from, where it's going to go, who it's going to go to. And, and then you can live with a, with, with, with a level of confidence. So I wanted to just take you through estate duty again quite um, quickly. Estate duty is the one that we spoke about, but I just wanted to give you a few examples of sort of the calculation. I've given you um, the percentages, how the percentages work, the 20% on the first million and 25% are, are, are on amounts over 30 million, but your first three and a half million is tax-free. So in your estate plan, you can always have three and a half million worth of assets because it's tax-free. So you don't ever have to plan beneath that number. But once your assets go north of 3.5 million, now you need an estate plan. Um, there's a few things that you can deduct from your estate duty, but there's not a lot. So it's going to be your funeral costs, um, any debts. So that's not really a deduction. That's to me, that's more of a settlement. And then the admin's expenses, your executor's fees, that type of thing. 
So that calculation of a state GT is, um, is, um, is quite useful to have in advance and to know how it works. Now, there's no transfer or estate duty between spouses. So what often happens is that a spouse will leave everything to another spouse, and that spouse will then get a seven million abatement instead of a three and a half, because essentially they'll get both. So that's quite a good way of doing it. It, it just means that you've kind of left all the eggs in one basket. I, I'm of the view that perhaps, because I've got an estate structure, but, 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 but I prefer the idea of giving some to my wife, some to my structure, and kind of dissipating it slowly so that when something happens to her one day, it's not, a, it's not all in one bucket. We've kind of already titrated it out. And specifically the wealth structure, that's where you want as much money to go as possible from an estate duty planning perspective. So I've done it that way, but you can do it either way. It's, it's, a, it's a complete um, non-issue. Something that people don't realize, and this is a big deal, so this is like, oh my goodness moment. And that is that CGT is paid on death. So everyone talks about a state duty. Look at this oak. The second he found out, he nearly had a heart attack. Um, and, and that's really the bottom line is because CGT is approximately 20%. It's 18% for individuals. So you're going to add another 18% onto your tax, but it's not a clean 18%. It's on the gain. So how those gains work are important. So the moment I die, SARS deemed me to have sold everything. And that sale will essentially trigger the capital gains tax calculation. So I'm probably going to own three types of assets. I'm probably going to own property. So if I bought my house in 1985 and I pass in 2021, I probably paid 50,000 Rand for my house and it's probably worth 5 million Rand now. So the capital gain at 18% on 5 million bucks, and I'm not talking about primary residence exclusions, I must be careful not to confuse the different tax things, but the gain on 5 million rand would be a million rand tax. And that's CGT. That's not a state duty. A state duty on 5 million rand assets would be another million rand. So I bought my house in 1985. I love where I live. My family loves where we live. And it's a magnificent home. It's got an acre of field. It's just wonderful. I don't really have much money because I'm not wealthy. I just bought my house, you know, that then. Um, but I've got enough money. I've got some savings and some property and some investments. But my house alone has just given, my death has just given my family an approximate 2 million rand bill. That's the sobering reality I need you to grasp today. That without a plan, your home life that you think you're leaving your family to continue living now has a 2 million rand invoice attached from the receiver of revenue. And if he doesn't get his money, he's going to sell your house. And this isn't to make you fear. This is reality. This is how it works. So we need to be planned. And we're Burns Acre people and clients, so we need to get ahead of this. We need to be smarter than the government, and we need to have a plan. So that's how we do the plan. So financial instruments, things like your shares, et cetera, well, the value will be the date of death. So if you bought Grindrod shares in 1990 at one rand, and now your Grindrod shares are worth 10 Rand, you've made a nine Rand gain per share. That tax is due and payable as you die. Not quite, you, you get a little bit of lead into provisional tax, but you get the point. You owe the money just because by, def by, by virtue of dying, you've just sold all your assets and triggered capital gains. And then for business assets, we need formal equity valuations, which SARS tend to accept or market valuations, which is much more difficult in the private sector, the private market, because of course there's no comparability, which is why the equity valuation is often accepted by SARS. Just to know, for SARS to accept a valuation, it'll, it'll need to be market related and, and at arm's length, and that CGT is in addition, which I've mentioned already. So if we just have a look at the calculation very quickly, it's all the value of your property, Property deemed, I, I don't really worry about that too much, but it's either my property or it's not. But the point is deemed might be something that's jointly owned or whatever the case may be, but it's your value. I mean, if it's your value, it's part of your assets, then any deductions, so the executive fees and, and the things we mentioned earlier, there's not much by way there, funeral costs, that gives you your dece deceased estate value. We then reduce the three and a half million abatement that the government give us, the generous three and a half million, and then we are left with a duishable amount. And that is what the 25% or the 20, the first 20, the first 30 million is taxed at 20% and the balance at 
That's how you calculate estate duty. It's not hard. It's just bad news if you've got a lot of assets and a lot of capital gains. So I hope that just gives you a sort of a lead into the calculation. Then something that I think is not often considered and one of the little value adds I wanted to bring today is all the information that's in your head is gone. And a lot of that information runs the family. So now what? Would you really like your spouse or loved one who's dealing with grief to now have to go and find passwords and the name of your banker and the insurance company details and the admin headache of what's in your head and not in their head is what we're talking about. So we're saying in order to help yourself, you need to do a few little things and you need to do it together. You need to have a high level list of all your, all your assets, your liabilities. Um, you need to have everything that you know written down that's important and so we've made a list and we've said here's a, 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 a here's your will here's your executor here's your accountant we will we'll give you the list so someone just asked will we get the presentation so you should get three documents from us today after the presentation you should get the presentation itself you should get the notebook and the notebooks in the same format so the format will help you sort of put your thinking into a document and then you should get a checklist. And the checklist is essentially what I'm talking about now. The checklist is going to force you to answer a whole lot of questions and say, have I told my spouse my bank password? Does she know where it is? Do I, does she know where my contacts are? I use business management software. Um, and in that business management software, I've actually got a, a document that literally lists every supplier. I mean, I've got it down to the key names of my doors. So that's not perfect, but the point is that there's so much of the information that's in my head in a system, and that system is accessible, and everyone knows where it is. So even though it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to pick up the pieces, I'm leaving them with the, I'm leaving them with the, 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 the instructions. I'm literally saying, here's everything. And my mind says, it must be far easier to have an instruction manual than have nothing. So that's what this is about passwords, key contacts, websites that you use. I'll give an example. I pay for the electricity myself in our family. So we're on a prepaid meter. So if they didn't know where the electricity code was and just the little process that I follow, they'd have to sort that out or they'd end up with no electricity. That's the type of stuff that practical, simple, but you don't want them worrying about the lights going off. And this isn't even worrying about cash, remember, this is literally how to type in the token. So it might sound simple, but if they don't know how to do it, who's going to do it? You're gone. So that's what I want you to, to, to look through. The documents, I've given you a long list, which you'll obviously get a copy of this, but it's things that you're going to need. Where's your anti-nuptial contract? How are you married? Where's your ID? Where's your proof of address? Where's your passport? Driver's license, unabridged birth certificate for children. Um, all of this stuff, this is what your executive is going to ask for. And you wouldn't believe the number of estates that are held up because they don't have a marriage certificate and they have to go through home affairs and we all know the process or we don't know the process, but the process doesn't work particularly well. So those documents, we're encouraging you to have those ready and understood. Key people, who are the access people? Who, you know, you know, who does your partner need to know? Pets, children, all of this stuff, like have a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, I know I'm repeating myself, but you really need to get it today. Like if you came to the seminar, you must have an interest in this. And if you don't have a plan, you will leave your family without the plan. It's very selfish in my opinion. It's, if something's going to happen to me, what I do, my family need to be protected. So more key documents, your insurance documents. It doesn't help to have all this insurance, insurance and no one knows where the policy is or who the broker is. Now I'm going to spend three months finding them and hunting down the policy number and it's a nightmare. Just keep it simple. That's the contact. Another nice thing to do, it depends on how your family set up, is we share everything, my wife and I. So it's very simple for us. Everyone knows that we share everything. So the insurer knows that. Everyone knows that. So all my financial advisors, they know it's both of us. So they have a lead into both of us permanently. Um, the tragedy for us would be if something happened to both of us, like an airplane, because then there's a gap. Um, and that's our reality that we've got to face. So insurance, income documents, your list of assets and liabilities, 
Um, and, and definitely if you're a list of assets and liabilities, I would talk to a professional like a tax guy or someone, maybe a lawyer or an ex maybe not the executor, but you want to make sure that list represents itself in the best and most tax efficient way. So you need to be aware of that. Um, IT information, cell phones. Everything's linked to your cell phone today, your banking, your everything. So make sure you have your partner's cell phone. If they do voice, uh, voice, if they do facial recognition or, 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 or if they use their fingerprint, then know what the password is so that you can get around that. Because otherwise you can't even log in. If we use Corona as an example, they're gonna go to the hospital, you're never gonna see them again. They're never gonna be able to touch anything again. Your touch screen and your fingers and you need your passwords. So this is scary stuff. It's the reality that we see too many people face. Um, just to lighten it up a little bit, if we look at uh, the picture, you know, we all know the marriage vows are till death do us part. And it is a great question. What happens when we get to the pearly gates, especially if we arrive together? Do we have to renew our vows or is there some sort of diversion? So I'll leave that with you for your preference. Um, the next slide is, 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 is actually just something I came up with for, for you. And that is a will is quite a cold thing. And I don't want this to be a cold process. That's actually why we're here, because to make it, to take it away from the cold. And so I think it's a great idea, and it's something I'm going to do, is to write your loved ones a letter and, and, and let that letter go with the will. Um, it's obviously not a prerequisite, it's not legally required, but it's a nice soft touch and you can make it intimate. Because we must understand, this is not, we're not talking about being 85 years old and dying of natural causes in the arms of our loved ones. We're talking about a tragedy. We're talking about a happy young family and one day someone's not there. And so perhaps not just having a will, but having a letter, a letter of wishes, a letter to your family, a letter to your children, um, and a really personal private letter. That's just something for you to think about um, as, you, as you plan this. Then when it comes to your children, I would encourage you to be more active. And, and, and this is so difficult because you, you, know, you would have chosen someone. Please make sure whoever you choose, it's legally documented and legally enforceable. Um, you've, we've discussed your life color, cover. Something to consider for your kids is whether the money goes into trust or not. And then how that trust is administered and who it's administered by. So if you have a, a, a fairly large business, and the business payout from an insurance perspective is substantial. If you've got five-year-old kids or 17-year-old kids, you know, giving a 17-year-old 10 million rand, I'm sure statistically that doesn't set him up for his future. I think statistically that probably sets him up for some sort of alcoholism and, 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 and chaos. So you've got to decide, if something happens to you, do you want your kids to have cash or do you want them to have a managed life? And a managed life means a trustee or trustees who will look after them and allocate the funds. Very difficult decision, um, but everyone has to make it you know, for themselves. So it's not just who will look after your kids, it's how will the money be looked after and how long will it last? Will it get them through varsity? Are they gonna have to start working at 13? Are they gonna have to phone Apple for a job? That type of thing. Um, so it's something for you to think about. Your investments, you know, depending on what you've invested in and why, if you don't put into your will, why or what you want to do with them, they're probably just going to get sold out. And they might be great investments and they might be highly beneficial for someone to use, you know, down the line, so the kids specifically. So if you tell people what your thinking is, then they've got a, a reason to understand it better. And then again, I talk about the plan and the, the, the letter. So that's something I just want you to pause on for a moment. because that's what we see. You know, when we sit with someone and they have just lost everything, I mean, the fear in the eyes is unbelievable. It's, 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 it's unbelievable because they literally don't even know how to make a payment. They don't know if they've got enough money. People often think they're rich. So the most common mistake people make is people think they're rich. And what I mean by that is they have someone who brings in a fairly large amount of money every month, but that's not what rich is. And that's certainly not what wealthy is. And the problem is if the person doesn't bring in the money every month, everything disappears. Everything changes in an instant. And if you don't have adequate insurance to match that revenue, the, the level of fear you're going to be exposing them to is unbelievable because it's completely unknown. I mean, that's what we're scared of. We're scared of the unknown. We're scared of how am I going to pay this? How am I going to live? How am I going to get the kids through school? How am I going to get myself through to retirement? So, and this is, again, the point of today is to say to you, 
Do you want to leave your loved ones in fear? Because that's what the absence of a plan will do, essentially. And they're going to have fear. We can't change that. But can we try and mitigate it? That's the million-dollar question. And I'll leave that with you. I'll leave that with you to answer. Something important I want you to understand is who your executor is. Uh, without being overly facetious, it's a little bit like who your accountant is. So saying my accountant went to tech or my executor works at the bank, that would freak me out. Okay. You, we're going to encourage you to get a good executor, not just any executor. The difference is incomparable. It's like with tax. If you're with Burns Aikert, your things should be sorted. Your, your tax should be efficient. You should constantly be getting a guidance and strategy as to how to move forward. With an executor, if you just get some random executor, you're going to put your family through some random process, meaning the paperwork won't be efficient. The time lag will be long. It'll be hard to deal with them. The response times will be slow. They will probably charge the maximum. And ex these wrap-ups take years. It's not the, the, the thinking that anyone can be the executor is not smart. So we ask you to consider the following. What qualifications do they have? What experience do they have? Are they about to retire? Point is me at 41 choosing an executor who's 67 years old. 10 years time, the guy's 77 and I'm, I'm only 51. We're disconnected. So the age of your executor is actually highly relevant to your age. And, and, and again, I would consider you to revisit these wills and letters and decisions regularly, whatever that means, as your circumstances move, but certainly within every three to five years, and unless your circumstances change rapidly. It's just an opportunity to reflect, and it's no different with the executor. What's their reputation? What do they do for a living? And then I like the personal touch. So is there an executor or a professional that you know that you feel comfortable with, that you would be comfortable dealing with your family, that you would be comfortable caring for your family's needs and making sure that they're answered and that the paperwork is done quickly and that the, the matter is prioritized. So I like the personal touch. My fee structure, again, have a look at that. Look at the support structure of the executor. If the guy works from his own desk by himself and he looks frazzled, versus the guy that comes from a firm with staff and organization. You know, I, I bear that in mind. I mean, the frazzled guy is probably not going to reply. He's probably going to find it difficult, whereas the organized firm is probably going to be organized. So something to think about. And then the location. You know, if you want, some people do still like to meet in person and talk. So where's your point is having a, an estate in Durban and an executor in Joburg, if that's the case. So you need to consider where they're based, especially for the older folk. Having uh, an executor in Belito and a home in Hillcrest, it's nearly an hour's drive. Like someone who's 70 or 80 years old doesn't need to be traveling for an hour to have these conversations. So there's a lot of factors that go into this, this executor decision. And, and these are just meant to guide you, not, not, not tell you what to do. Um, I quite like this one. Um, it's, quite, it's, it's a little bit of humor. Hopefully it doesn't offend too many people, but it is quite funny because you don't get into, atheist, into heaven unless you believe. And of course, an atheist wouldn't believe that. So having said that, um, hopefully I've covered everything. Uh, we can move into our Q&A now. I think, Tammy, you can allow people to unmute themselves, but we're, we're just going to keep it really informal. Um, hopefully that wasn't too long. I think I managed to do it in about just over half an hour. Thank you for listening. For any of you who actually were listening, I hope it was all of you and I hope you took some value. Um, but John, let's have some questions and then we can have a brief chat and we can wrap it up. So Pascal, that's a good question. Uh, sorry, Tammy. Let me just do Pascal's question. So that's a good question, Pascal. And I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I don't think there is a minimum value because I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, we had a, a good friend's father pass recently, and he married a lady 30 years ago, actually. And the lady is is, is of she was a housewife of of absolute proportion, and he didn't he didn't have any estate. Um, you know, he probably had his house and, and, and a few things. He didn't have any estate duty. Put it that way. And yet he was, he had a significant estate duty bill, uh, or not a bill, the estate duty, that's the wrong word, but the legal fees, the executive's costs, his wife had to pay this bill with no assets. So he would have been under the three and a half million 
And I don't think that there is a, 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 a minimum. I think a lot of people just declare no estate. So, you know, in terms of, of South Africa, but no matter what your estate is, it gets declared, you pay the costs and that's the story. So I think that that answers your question. Tom, I did answer your question in the presentation. So you will get copies of everything from Tammy. Tammy, did you have a question? I was just letting you know that someone had made a comment. Ah, okay. Brad, I've got a question from somebody who's asked, who would be the best type of person to select as an executor? So I think there's, there's, there's two categories to that. I quite like um, lawyers who do ex executor work. So certainly if you've got a good lawyer or a good law firm, I would, I would talk to them. And the other category is I quite like using appropriately qualified financial advisors or financial advisory firms. So my, my executor is a lawyer who owns a financial advisory firm. So I've got the best of both. Um, and that's quite nice because they understand the legalities. They do it. They, they must do these things regularly, though. So that's kind of the, the caveat. Is it's not good enough to have a lawyer who will do an estate. Be very cautious of the language. If someone says, I will do your estate, be concerned. If someone says, I do estates and I have an estate department, that, that gives me a lot more con confidence. So be very careful of the difference because a lot of people can do estates. And today we're encouraging you not to go with someone who can. I could probably do it in the States, as an example. Um, I'm probably appropriately qualified. I've got all the books. I kind of know where to go. I'm not the guy you want doing your estate. That's the point. You don't want some oak trying to figure it out, trying to make sure it's done well. You want someone who knows how to do it and does it every day. So I would lean towards the good lawyers and financial advisors. If there's no other questions, I think um, we can wrap it up. We will send you the docs. I'm very grateful that you gave up uh, in an hour of the time this morning. I hope it helped you guys. And you don't have to ask, ask questions now. I mean, we, we, we're, we're at work. You can ask questions when, when, when the presentation is over. So you're welcome to reach out at any time. Something I did want to uh, mention is that uh, I'm more than happy. We have cl uh, private client vaults, uh, digital vaults. So I'm more than happy for you to keep a copy of your checklist, of your plan, of your will, um, of your instructions, of your letter in your own private client vault, a digital vault. So the only person that would have access to that would be myself and RT. Um, so so not even we won't even share it amongst you know not even multiple clients. It's a little bit like a bank vault. It's set up so that each person's information is completely locked. So if you do want to do that, you're more than welcome. There's no cost. Uh, it's literally just going to be stored on our private vault, not going to be stored with your information. That's I'm trying to make the distinction. Your, dis your information is, is stored in our client vault. This is a digital, private, separate vault that I've set up to be able to save this type of thing for, for, for you, if you like. So you're more than welcome to use that. You're more than welcome to reach out at any time with any questions. And we hope that the, the width gave you a broader perspective um, around this topic. Matt, can you help me? Yes. How's it, Rob? Uh, how are you, Brett? Um, I, I'm actually busy with this aspect at the moment. Um, in fact, for the last month or two, I've been on it. So this is very apt to me. Um, my structure is somewhat different, as you know. We've been working together for a while, structuring things for the business aspect. Um, maybe we could just set up some time um, to just run through some of these things which are rather complex um, in my structure, but very valid in terms of the bank accounts and so forth. Um, you know, running through the shares and where the shares are positioned and so forth um, is, is quite an interesting aspect to, to, to what you just delivered now. So um, I don't know how you feel. Is, is that something we can do? Yeah, that so Rob, that's exactly... Yeah, so Rob, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to, I want you guys, I mean, you're, 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 you're perfect. I'm so glad you're here because you've got the right setup. Your setup's complex enough and, and you need to be considering these things. So I'm encouraging all of you to reach out, book a meeting. Let us help you with the thinking from a commercial perspective. Um, but really just 
answer your questions as you do it. So I'm more than happy to do that, Rob. We can tee that up next week. Tammy will make a note to, um, to set that up for us and we'll prepare it and I'll give you all the docs and we can work through it and you can ask questions because even though I'm not an expert in all of these elements, I understand them so I can help you. That's the point. And if, if we like, I'll give you an example, like life insurance, like I'm not a life insurance guy. So I can't tell you the details of life insurance, but I can tell you how it works, why it works and what it should look like. And so when you talk to a life insurance guy, it might be useful to have me supporting the conversation and helping you get to the right conclusion. That's what I'm very happy to do for all of you. Um, so you're more than welcome to reach out and we'll sort that out. Okay, thanks. That's great. I'll, I'll okay. check to you. Brad, Brad, is Brian hacking? Hi, Brian. A very quick question. Uh, what is the highest fee that can be levied by a, an executor? I, I don't know it off by heart, Brian. I tried to look at it, but it's about 3.5%. I think it's about 35 is the max. And most executors would do it for 25 So, I mean, there's a percent on the table just if you ask and have the right executor. That's okay. how, how big a deal it is. But you, you must be very careful because if you don't ask, it's like a 90% probability that they'll take the maximum. I understand. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I hate, I hate leaving. My staff will tell you. I always have more to say. And also, over time, more questions pop up. People think of things like you guys have just done. So anyway, I was, I was giving the, the farewell. I better do it before my staff will come in and kick me. But um, thanks again, guys. Again, if you have a question, just send me a note or, or, or give us a call. Uh, it, the whole team's here to help you, so there's no problem at all. And um, we're really grateful. I'll come up with a. Hopefully, I'll come up with another good topic soon, um, and we can we can try and add some value just in your broader context. So have a good day, guys. Look after yourselves, and thanks again.